Welcome to episode 299 of the Bonfire Gaming Podcast. I am your host, Morgan, a.k.a. Bon Diesel, and this week we'll be talking about hysteria over Xbox's new tactics, Black Myth Wukong's big sales, Nintendo's museum opening, and much more. Before we get started, subscribe to The Bonfire on your favorite podcast app and leave a review on Spotify or iTunes, or... Subscribe to the Bond Diesel YouTube channel to get all of my videos, including this podcast. A big thank you to everyone who supports as a YouTube member or Twitch subscriber. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and all of my other content, please check out the link in the show description. You can also support my show by sharing new episodes on social media platforms with friends or whoever uh, wants to listen to you. Let's get into the gaming news. And we're going to kick it off with Xbox, which had quite a bit of new info coming out this week and prepare for a rant. Uh, at Gamescom uh, opening night live with Jeff Keighley, uh, we found out that Indiana Jones, uh, The Great Circle, is confirmed to be coming out on December 9th on Xbox and PC, uh, including Game Pass, and then sometime in the spring for PlayStation 5. This set off the expected uh, hullabaloo, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Um, following this up, uh, Phil Spencer did do an interview at Gamescom where he talked about how they had learned a lot from releasing those first four games. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was Pentiment, Grounded, Sea of Thieves, and Hi-Fi Rush. Uh, and that that is going to influence their decisions moving forward. In case you don't know about how all of that worked, um, basically Hi-Fi Rush and Pentiment didn't make any splash at all. Um, and Grounded did fairly well. I, I believe it got into the top 10 or top 20 of their sales charts. Uh, but Sea of Thieves did extremely well and I believe actually led uh, in their um uh, sales for a bit on on that uh, platform uh, and the most recent news is that they sold over a million copies so when when this happened and when this got announced about uh, what they're doing with Indiana Jones I, I remember I made a tweet where I, I quote tweeted I was like people are gonna lose their mind over this um, and they did and so th the general reaction has been that um, the, the way that Xbox wants to release their games uh, and where they're going to be released is confusing for consumers, which is, I think, kind of fair, but that it's devaluing uh, the, the platform, having an Xbox, um, uh, and that it means that eventually every single Xbox game is going to be uh, multi-platform and that there's going to be no point in buying Xbox and Xbox is now failing. And so, like, most of that stuff just isn't true. Now, some of it comes in subjective territory. Uh, if you've paid attention to this podcast, you know that, you know, I'm an Xbox fan. Uh, I'm an X-Bot, if you're uh, into that kind of name-calling. Um, I, I do try to have some perspective, though, and be realistic. But my issue is that I feel like there's an overcorrection that I do at times, and that I genuinely believe uh, kind of what, how I described it in the opening of the show, that the reaction to anything that Xbox does is hysteric. Uh, and what that implies, at least in my opinion, is that it's not genuine, that it's, it's over the top for reasons other than the actual subject of what's happening. It, it, it's been literally years at this point that we should have been expecting and that we've known that they've had interest in doing this kind of thing. Um, we, we know from the ABK leaks uh, that there was a lot of animosity from Bethesda Zenimax uh, after the acquisition uh, and people in those studios or in the, you know, the, the corporate side of, of that publisher that they didn't want to be Xbox exclusive. There is, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was, I think it was Starfield um, talking about, you know, you know, why are some games going to be allowed to stay multi-platform uh, I believe it was things like Minecraft and things like that, but not Starfield or other products that they were making. So th that leads us to this moment where we're now seeing them do this. And I guess 
what I struggle with is is how many people I'm seeing like, oh, Xbox is in a tailspin, um, and, and they're just not like like you know from those ABK leaks or you know just from you know paying attention to what's going on. Um, Xbox is in a weird spot because they are in third place, quote unquote, <laughs> or, or or whatever in the console war or the console competition or platform competition, but they're healthy. They're, they're doing great. They're making tons of money. Um, they're, they're doing very well financially. They aren't struggling. Uh, and then they have a parent company, Microsoft, who has had some ups and downs, but overall is still, you know, one of the richest companies in the world. Um, probably too rich. It, it would probably be a good uh, thing to say. Um, so then you look at the two companies ahead of them, which is a measure that I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and Nintendo and, and PlayStation, where Nintendo s- seems pretty solid. They're, I believe you know that they're sitting on a big nest egg of money. Uh, they're probably still selling a ton of Switches, which is crazy, You know, eight, nine years later, whatever it is. They're still putting out games like for their uh, outgoing hardware, and I'm sure that's doing great. Um, and then you have Sony and PlayStation, who seems like things may, may be a little rockier there, um, but they have the stats that people talk about, right? And, and that's kind of what I, I want to get at, is that I, I think a big problem with a lot of the reaction to these things that are happening is, is you'll see that, like, uh, Doom, uh, you know, the, the the Dark Ages or whatever gets announced, that it's going to be day one um, on PlayStation. Uh, you, we find out Indiana Jones is doing that when Hi-Fi and Pentiment and, and Grounded and Sea of Thieves got announced. And in a reaction you see a lot is people being like, oh, well, Xbox is never going to sell more consoles than PlayStation if they keep doing this. And like, if you still think that's Xbox's goal, then you just, in my opinion, haven't been paying attention for literally years now, a generation and a half. Um, I'm sure coming off of 360, going to Xbox One, there was probably still a hope, you know, that they could remake some of that success that people always talk about like all the downfalls in 360 which is fair in some capacity um i don't think people often talk about how um, i believe the playstation 3 ended up outselling the 360 uh that it, it ended up not actually beating it in the long run even though i believe it outpaced it pretty well earlier in the generation but and that was mostly sony's fault because they way overcharged for that console but then we move to you know the Xbox One, PS4 generation, and, and PlayStation Four just dominated. Um, you know that was partially because uh, Xbox had the worst introduction of the Xbox One generation ever. Um, well, it couldn't have been worse. PlayStation, on a PR point of view, just dunked on them relentlessly with doing like the game sharing and all that, and all of that stuff that happened. This was in the days of actual E3 still, and it's just like. It was it was it was the worst thing that could have happened for Xbox if they were trying to mimic or even beat PlayStation at what they do because they lost they lost significantly I, I believe the numbers ended up being that for um, every three PlayStation consoles sold there were two Xboxes sold and um, and that was pretty bad uh, obviously. Uh, where in this generation, it's for every two PlayStations, it's one Xbox, and that's probably a generous um, stat. But like Phil Spencer said before, uh, the the biggest issue with them losing that last gen Xbox One, PlayStation Four, was that that's when everyone built their digital library. Um, I haven't bought a physical game since the 360 or PS3 generation, um, and even then, I was starting to buy some of my games digitally. I believe. Uh, and then with Xbox One, you know, I went all digital. And I was an exception being an Xbox, you know, owner where, you know, PlayStation owners are doing that too. And PlayStation 4 sold like crazy. They have a insane install base, and I believe still do to this day. And so what, what the point of all of this is, is that there's just too many PlayStation owners for Xbox's goal to ever be to outsell consoles again. They they have too big of an install base. People have put too much money into that platform. And and that's just, you know, they, they just aren't going to capture a lot of those people, or at least not exclusively. So then you look at, well, you know, what, what else is going on then? And, and I guess my issue is that 
you know, people seem to think that the only way to judge the health of the, the three major gaming platforms is by, you know, console sales. And if you measure it by that, then, you know, Nintendo blows everyone out of the water. But then even if you just look at PlayStation and Microsoft uh, or, or Xbox, it, it, the story is not that simple. And even from those ABK leaks and stuff like that, like we saw that from an actual like financial standpoint, Xbox is plenty healthy, uh, is making plenty of money, um, is making, oh, I believe, and I would have to see the chart again, but from what I remember, and you can tell me I'm wrong in the comments of the YouTube video or whatever, um, bring proof, please. Uh, I believe it was that, you know, either from profit margin, I think it was profit margin. I don't think it was, I don't know if it was actual sales or not. Xbox and PlayStation were like, Xbox was like right there with them. And I believe, and one of the metrics was ahead of Nintendo, which is insane. Like that's crazy. And so I, I think the problem is that people see these moves and they, and they see what's happening maybe in the future for Xbox and assume that this is a failing company in their death throes. I, everyone always compares this to the Sega situation and what happened with Sega when they went down the multi-platform and eventually stopped making consoles and things like that. And I just, I, I think that's so misguided because, you know, Sega was in serious financial trouble when that happened. They, they were not okay. Um, and that's why they've become what they are now, which is a shell of their former selves. And it, at least in my opinion, from, you know, all the information I've gathered and what I pay attention to, it, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it seems like Xbox is just going to keep putting out games and making consoles um, and not really caring that much of how many people buy those. They're just an option. Um, and, and, and that they're okay with that. Um, I believe the sustainability of Game Pass uh, and likely the sustainability of them continuing to make and offer any hardware is dependent on them probably doing some of this multi-platform stuff. Um, they have to pay for that $70 billion Activision acquisition somehow. And it's probably not going to be selling games to their 30 million person uh, install base. It, it's going to be selling to people on PC, uh, whether it's Game Pass or actual games. And it's going to be selling some games to Nintendo and PlayStation folks as well. I, I just... This stuff is also strange to me. Um, and, and to me, it seems like it's, it really should be the role of especially journalist to, you know, educate, to, to, to interview, to, to get takes on this about here's what Xbox is doing. Uh, and here's how it could work or how it could fail. And, and that's okay. But instead you see headlines from fairly prominent people being like, you know, you know a, a a drowning xbox puts another one of their exclusives on play and that's just like that isn't that just isn't true it seems like that's objectively false and and it's such a bummer like even to the point where i i give jason trier his his flowers all the time about being in my opinion the only like real journalist in gaming and even he's doing the same thing and it doesn't seem like he's saying these things and being informed off of uh you know how you know from insiders it's just his opinion which is fine he can have it he's way more knowledgeable about all of this stuff than i am uh, or, or probably anyone listening to this is but i just i i, I think it's weird the, the the way that this stuff is being framed now obviously you're you're gonna have the folks online stuff like that even uh, i believe schreier had recently made a tweet where he's like you know, you know, the issue isn't really whether they sell more consoles or not. I think we're probably in agreement there. He's like, the, the issue is how, how they're outraging their existing community. And it's like, I think sometimes we forget that the, the people listening to this podcast, the people on gaming social media or involved in gaming YouTube and Twitch and, and those places make up like a minuscule part of the consumer base uh, for, for gaming. Uh, and I'm not even talking about mobile. I'm just talking about like, you're, like, I have friends who, who do still have consoles. I, I have family and stuff who, who own an Xbox or, or whatever. And they play games like a couple times a week, multiple times a week. They don't follow gaming Twitter. They don't watch YouTube videos about gaming news. They don't listen to this podcast because they don't care. They have other, they have kids. Like they have other things they're focused on. Right. And I, I think that we often overestimate how representative uh, the outrage is about this stuff um, because, uh, well, for multiple reasons, a big one being that a lot of the outrage is pushed by a relatively small number of people 
who have a vested interest in outrage. Um, you know, monetizing social media and YouTube, monetizing gaming opinions and hot takes has really kind of ruined these conversations because if you had, like what I said before, a content creator or journalist going out and making, you know, articles or videos or whatever about the nuances of this and how it could work or not and doing interviews with people who are in the know or can speculate on these things, those videos would get a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand views. Uh, or, or those tweets would get, you know, similar, you know, small numbers. But if you say that Xbox is failing and spitting in their customers' faces and that they're, uh, they're going to shut down and they're going to become a third party, uh, you know, whatever uh, platform uh, or publisher, you know, that, that borderline dishonest uh, coverage, uh, but you know, at least sensational or clickbaity or engagement baity way of covering it um, is gets millions of views and clicks Be, because people it's fun it's more fun right and I, I think that's what a lot of this comes down to I suspect internally all of these places I bet you've got PlayStation and Nintendo keeping an eye on this stuff being like yeah we're probably gonna have to do some of this stuff eventually probably not right now they're both very healthy in the current gen. But they're seeing Xbox uh, as a company in a really unique situation, or at least this is how I take it, that they're a company that is in second or third place, depending on who you're measuring their competitors, uh, which is a whole different conversation. Um, you, you're seeing this company that is behind, but is very healthy. Therefore, they can afford to, to make risky moves. They can afford to put some of their exclusive games on their competitors' platforms. They can afford to, you know, not focus on the same thing as their competitors. It's, you know, as I try to wrap up this and, and not rant about it too long, I I, I just think it's weird that um, I, I understand from like you know gamers why you know they are very focused on very tangible things like console sale numbers and being like, oh, PlayStation's the best because they sell the most consoles compared to Xbox. Um, and maybe they don't look at the offerings of, you know, first and third party games that do or don't come to, uh, you know, those platforms or, or how Game Pass, you know, is, in, is, is involved in that conversation and all of that. But what's hard for me are like known content creators or, or social media influencers and journalists and how there's so rarely a, any conversation about like, you know, just because PlayStation is selling a lot of consoles doesn't necessarily mean they're like killing the game like that. They're doing really, really well. Um, you know, consoles, you know, the hardware is, is a zero to extremely low profit margin sale. Now, the reason you want to sell your own hardware is because you get, you know, the full, you know, when someone buys the last of us on a PlayStation, you know, Sony gets that for the most part, entire chunk of money. Uh, where if if they buy it through Steam on PC, they have to pay Steam their fee. Or, you know, you know if, and when uh, Xbox sells Hi-Fi Rush on PlayStation Five, PlayStation Five is you know PlayStation Sony is taking their cut out of that sale. So obviously you want to get your own hardware out there, but Microsoft has always had the advantage in Xbox, or at least in recent generations, of being able to you know have their own consoles, but also you know, get that benefit from you know, selling games on PC, you know, selling it through their own app can be a bit tumultuous because that app isn't great. Um, and then they have to pay steam if they do it through there, but they just, they've always at least had the idea of, of doing this multi-platform thing and not being so locked down and so obsessed with making sure they sell the most consoles. And I think that we had a pivot that happened during the Xbox one generation where I suspect the people at Xbox realized Okay, you know, because of what's going on right now, we're just never gonna like our goal will never again be to sell more consoles than PlayStation. It's just never gonna happen. They they they've sold too many, too many people are there buying digital games. They're they're not gonna no one's you know, a lot of those customers are never going to leave PlayStation. So then you have to change your calculus and become a company that is uh, more attractive to everyone, even if they own other platforms, which they're doing in various ways. Um, because that that situation is wrapped at this point. So long story short, 
I think a lot of people are being really dishonest about the way they cover this, uh, about the way they talk about it, whether it's known people like journalists, content creators and influencers or people who are just commenting and, 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 and kind of getting in that algorithm. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of not very genuine uh, actors in all of this, but maybe that's just my bias. But that's where I will. Uh, I'll try to lay off of this rant and hopefully I made a few points in there that that, that mean literally anything. I have no idea. Speaking of Xbox and continuing with them, uh, they did announce some new adaptive controllers uh, as well as the ability to download some files where you can 3D print um, some more specialized uh, like joysticks and stuff like that to use in these adaptive controllers. Um, this is in addition to, uh, I believe is what, two or three years ago now, they, they had kind of, it was a kind of like that, that base uh, for the adaptive stuff where it had like, I was like 15 or 20 plugins. So you could plug in all these adaptive things. And this is really cool. Um, most of the platforms, I know PlayStation has their own kind of adaptive thing. Um, I, I have a, f a family I work with. I, I work in that you know field of, of folks who have intellectual and physical disabilities. Um, and I, I did have a funny conversation. And this is probably my uh, bias coming out as well where um, a family was asking about that. They know I'm in the games and stuff like that. And I showed them what Xbox is offering, where they have those peripherals that, you know, they have a pretty large number of them at this point. And they work with, uh, you know, other peripherals too, like third-party ones because of the, the way that they work. Um, and then I showed them the PlayStation one where it's that circle that has all the buttons on the side. And like, I remember the family being like, like, that's a cool idea. But it looks like they made that to look cool, which it does. Uh, and, and while I'm sure it works fine, uh, you could definitely tell they were like, that looks like kind of a gimmick uh, where, especially now with this new adaptive stuff, um, this stuff just seems like a little more like it was probably designed in, uh, in concert with people who are actually going to use it uh, where, um, you know, I could be completely wrong about the PlayStation one. I don't know. I try not to have an opinion about that because that's outside my range. I just, the reaction of the family that um, saw all this was, was kind of funny, but this is cool. The, the more of this stuff, the better. Um, I, I, I know people in person who have used these type of, uh, these type of things. And, um, you know, we want to get as many people playing games as we can. It's a really good escape. It's a really good hobby for a lot of people. And, uh, I'm glad that they're bringing more people into the tent. Uh, we're also bringing more SKUs into the tent. So uh, during Gamescom, Xbox announced that they have three new hardware SKUs coming, uh, and they will be released on October 15th, and you can pre-order them now. It is a one terabyte Series S, a uh, one terabyte digital Series X, and a two terabyte disc Series X. Um, of course, I forgot to write down the prices for these. And I'm not going to stop to do it now. Uh, but basically, the pricing isn't that great. It's it's kind of bad. I think the Series S is 350. Um, the digital series X, I think is four fifty. It's a $50 discount, um, because it doesn't have the disc drive. And then the two terabyte, uh, series X that has a disc drive is $600. And, uh, people have been losing their mind about that. It's a, it's a, technically it's a fair price. If a base disc series X is four ninety nine, you know, the memory, that extra terabyte of memory is about a hundred bucks. And, uh, that's how they're coming to that. It also does have a, custom paint job where it's like black and has like stars on it it looks really cool and i think it's limited edition as well so it's not like it's going to be available everywhere forever it's going to be probably a one run thing um regardless i think the pricing is fine it's what to, it's what's to be expected um unless they just can't do it like unless it's just unsustainable for them i really think this would have been a really good time to try to do a pretty aggressive price cut um to try to get the conversation even just for the optics of it you know man drop that 512 you know gigabyte series s to like 199 or you know 249 maybe do the one terabyte series s at you know maybe 299 uh do the digital series x at what three ninety nine maybe you know get it down there, um, do the you know the, the, the or do the digital one like three fifty or maybe four hundred and then drop the disc one down to four fifty. I I don't know. I I just think this was an opportunity, especially with all the games that are coming for Xbox in the next year and a half or so. Uh, that I think really is going to give a, a pretty good value argument for Xbox. Um, I, I really think they'd be they'd be smart to make their hardware like really hard to not buy, but. 
you know, again, with all of this stuff, you're just assuming the powers that be know what they're doing. Uh, but then also remembering that they're human and they may have no idea. Uh, then the final thing is we found out that Avowed uh, is confirmed to only be 30 FPS on consoles, at least at launch. Um, this is my own speculation, but there's almost certainly going to be a 60 FPS patch. Um, there, the, part of this announcement, there was an interview with the dev, uh, the head dev or the director of the game, I believe, who said that making performance modes is at least for them one of the last things that they focus on when they're about to release a game. I would be willing to bet that's probably true for most games um, and that when things pop up in the last couple months or last few weeks, that just gets pushed. And that seems to make sense because how of how often we see games, if they don't have a performance mode at launch, it's normally like a couple weeks after. The only one I can think of that hasn't gotten a performance patch within at least a few months has been uh, Sinua's uh, Saga, Hellblade 2. Um, and I still believe it will at some point. I, I think we will definitely get a patch uh, at some point that will add a performance mode to that. We, in fact, just with Starfield, just got a performance mode for Series S that gives you 60 FPS on that, which is insane. Um, I genuinely don't know how they did it because um, the, the kind of reviews or the, the chatter around that is that it actually like looks pretty good. It's It's not like a complete mess like you would kind of expect it to be. So... I mean, I, I, what's the point of getting mad about this stuff at this point? I, I can't be bothered to. If this bothers you enough, um, if you're a, an FPS queen, then you should probably be buying an Xbox uh, or a, a PC anyways. Um, I, I think on this subject, it's interesting because we found out that the new Monster Hunter game is going to be like this as well. And it's so interesting because... Um, in the previous conversation with, you know, multi-platform games, you know, I've seen people being like, well, I'm just going to go to PC. I'm not going to buy an Xbox ever again, or, or maybe console is the, is the conversation. And like, that's cool. But I'm telling you right now that if you, like you say, you want to drop console today and you want to buy a PC and that's what you want to do forever. One PC stuff. PC isn't, it's not as simple as just having a PC. Um, hopefully it is. Hopefully you never have any major issues and you never have to fix anything, but you probably will, uh, even if it's fairly minor stuff. Um, having a PC in some capacity requires at least a somewhat more tech-savvy uh, knowledge base than just having a console. It, it's just different, um, especially if you have real issues. And then you start getting into paying people to fix it. PC repair stuff is a racket. It's super expensive. Um, and not to mention that a, say a $500 Series X or PS5, which I don't even think that's the price anymore, um, that is a, that's half or a little more than half of the price of a graphics card for a PC, a good one. Um, I know someone will get into the comments or, 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 or clap at me every now and then and be like, well, uh, with used and, and all this, or, you know, getting two or three year old or two or three generation old hardware, which can still work. I can make a, a gaming PC for $500. It's better than a Series X. You probably can't. Like, I think just the pricing of PC hardware now, you, you almost certainly can't. Um, and even if you can, you're talking about used parts for sure. No warranties. You've got all those issues, especially in the post Bitcoin or even current Bitcoin era. You're probably getting hardware that was abused if you're getting it cheap enough to make it, you know, better. Um, and then the, the, but then the argument is always, well, then I'll spend two thousand bucks now on a nice PC, and I'll just upgrade it over the years, and I'll end up saving money. Look, I've had I, I the current PC I have, I built like six or seven years ago. I have upgraded it through the years. I've definitely spent way more on it than I ever have on all the consoles I've bought in the last fifteen years. That's been partially by choice. But you don't want a PC to, to run everything at minimum spec because then you should just have a console, uh, even medium spec in some arguments. So if you have a PC, and, and, you know you should have a good one, in my opinion. And then when you have a PC, that there is something to be said for. There's always kind of that FOMO. There's always kind of that like temptation to upgrade and to do things. And sure, you don't have to do that, but you'll want to. You know, having a PC and being a PC gamer isn't just, I'm going to buy a $2,000 PC and then I'm going to buy another one in eight years. Like no one does that, or at least not many people do that. 
And so um, if you really care about frames and performance and 4K, 60 FPS or 120 FPS or 800 FPS, whatever, you know, th- there is a route for that. But I think I still think in, in this day, I still think that you're probably better off the majority of gamers, you know, more casual folks who maybe aren't super savvy are still better off with these consoles. And I still think they're pretty good. Um, they're obviously getting pretty aged at this point. Tech wise, I still think that they were pretty solid at release. Um, but, you know, that stuff moves quick. So, uh, you know, a valid at 30 FPS sucks. I can almost guarantee there's going to be a 60 FPS option eventually. I wonder how much of this was possibly due to Unreal Engine 5 uh, and how they upgraded it from four, like fairly recently, like in the last year, which uh, I suspect with Unreal Engine 4 and 5 is maybe as smooth as a engine upgrade can go for a game, but I can't imagine it was easy. Um, And so part of me wonders if that might be a part of the issue here, that they're probably still wrapping up some of that transition, Um, as well as Unreal Engine 5 is really challenging on on you know, PS5 and Series X hardware. It's um, it, it's really interesting that had Unreal Engine 5 not come out, like, maybe if it came out now instead of a few years ago, um, and games weren't going to be coming out with Unreal Engine 5 for two or three more years at least, I, I think this current gen would be looked at a lot differently if games are still on Unreal Engine 4 like primarily um, because the current consoles can run those games fairly well, the ones that did come out on Unreal Engine 4. Um, it almost seems like there was this, this like bad timing where Unreal Engine 5 uh, in, in, or similar tech with other games was is probably more suited for whatever's coming next, the PlayStation 6, whatever Xbox is doing next hardware-wise. And it seems like we just had a bad timing there that's going to make this current gen look worse than it probably should, uh, but it just kind of is. So, I don't know, interesting stuff. Okay, now we move over to a couple bits of PlayStation news. We have uh, Sony has confirmed that Concord was in development for eight years before its release. I believe this year, I think it came out. Uh, I think the, I, b- I believe the Metacritic score is in the 70s somewhere. Um, this is just a weird one. It's, it's, it's PlayStation kind of trying to delve into that hero shooter, first person shooter kind of world with one of their own first party games, um, which is a big deal for them. They need to do that. Uh, they, you know, while they are the best at the third person action adventure, sad dad games, uh, you know, they, I bet, I, I bet they want to expand their boundaries a bit when it comes to the, this type of thing. And, uh, it seems like it's, it's okay. It's a good first go at it, especially with all the drama going on with Bungie and destiny and how that all kind of, uh, seems like it's a little, you know, tumultuous at this point. Um, I, I, I think that, we are, are going to see them uh, delve more into this. I suspect Concord's going to kind of disappear quietly uh, pretty quickly. Um, but I, I don't think it's I actually think this, this was really smart by PlayStation um, to try to do this. Um, and they'll take the lessons from this and probably improve in the future. So, you know, hopefully with games like Marathon or other games that they try to do like this, we'll see those lessons implemented. We also have uh, news that uh, PlayStation 5s are uh, getting sold out and have had a huge sales boost in China. Uh, and this is almost certainly due to the Black Myth Wukong uh, release. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, good good for them. That's awesome. It's, it's not a bad thing, uh, especially uh, because, you know, China especially is such a PC-centric gaming uh, you know, vibe there that uh, for various reasons, consoles, at least at one point, were extremely hard to get uh, get through and, and to buy there. Um, so, you know, good for them. It's not a bad thing. And then our lone bit of Nintendo news is that the Nintendo Museum is going to open uh, on October 2nd of this year. And uh, man, if, if this isn't one of the examples of how uh, Nintendo is just doing a different thing than the other two platforms. Uh, it's what I kind of hinted to before, where Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox are definitely still competitors. But they've never been less competitors now than they ever have been, and it's only going to get less competitive over the years. Um, it, unless things change, unless something drastic happens, because Nintendo is definitely sticking to that we don't care about graphics. We don't care about necessarily how big games are or how uh, cinematic or whatever. 
we're doing family, we're doing handheld, you know, we're going to just dominate this part of the market. And they have, they, they, they are, you know, I, I bet the other two platforms are very jealous of them in a lot of ways. So you have them going that direction. Then you have PlayStation doing the traditional thing. We want to sell hardware. We're going to sell third person action adventure, sad dad games. Uh, and we're, we might dabble in some other stuff, but that's our power. That's our, that, that's our niche. And we're going to hit it hard and it's working out really well for them. And then we have Xbox going the third direction of we're not super worried about hardware. We're trying to look way ahead to things like cloud to multi-platform. You know, we're still going to try to support you know, our brand. I think Xbox will continue to do hardware and I think they'll continue to have exclusives, but not in a, a as rigid of a sense as maybe the other platforms. Uh, so we're going to go off and we're going to try that thing out. And so uh, I, I just think this is cool. I think it's very interesting. And with Nintendo opening up a museum, you know, it, it's it's just because uh, uh, it's been arguably the most impactful platform on the, the general public of all of them. Uh, I, it's just it's interesting. It's an interesting conversation. Um, while I don't want to age 10 years, even though I will inevitably, I will be extremely curious to see what the landscape is in a decade. Um, because I think it's going to look a lot different th than it does now. And I have no idea what that means. So we'll have to wait and see. Okay. And then getting into a few stories that aren't directly related to the platforms necessarily. Uh, we had Final Fantasy 16 get its PC release announcement for September 17th during Gamescom. Uh, and this was kind of interesting because there were a lot of rumors that people thought this was going to be the uh, Final Fantasy on Xbox uh, big thing. And that's not what happened. Uh, during interviews, though, the game director did say that they they have a dream of putting uh, 16 onto Xbox, uh, and, but they, they need they need to focus on one thing at a time, um, which is interesting because I bet they're a big enough studio that they don't actually have to do that. Um, but maybe I mean this it's a big game and it's a big project. Um, I still kind of wonder how much a port to PC really takes. Um, it might be more than you think because. Uh, you know, the, just the simple challenge of making PC games is that you're dealing with people who have eight-year-old computers and you want to try to cater to them if you can because they're a big part of the consumer base. Uh, and then you also have people with, you know, $10,000 computers, brand new, who want to get the worth out of that. And so you, you know, trying to cater to that infinite, uh, complicated mess of hardware that your games have to try to support. I have to assume the hardest thing to port for is PC. Uh, if you don't start there, uh, where I suspect when you go from PC to the consoles, it's a little easier because you have kind of a, a set base. Um, so it, it's probably fair that, that they can't, you know, that that's what they're focused on now. Um, I still very much expect to eventually see Final Fantasy 16 on Xbox though. Uh, then we had Black Myth Wukong, uh, which released. Um, it got a Metacritic score. It currently has one of 81, which is very solid. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, there was some weird kind of controversy around it uh, beyond some of the stuff that's been going on, talking about the studio and how it may not be uh, the best environment in the world for their employees. Um, but that they a co-publisher, which I believe is a arrangement that's kind of unique Um the specific arrangement is due to their locality, um, sent out a do's and don'ts list to multiple content creators uh, who were given review codes. Um, it does appear that this wasn't related to embargoes or, you know, whether or not, you know, people or NDAs or anything like that. Um, but basically this co-publisher was saying like, uh, don't say anything that's offensive in any way uh, to what I would call more of a right wing or conservative uh, a, you know, type of, uh, people or government, which I think is probably the key word there. Um, if you don't know, China is extremely controlling about the things that can be said in media, including in reviews and things like that. Um, to the point of, uh, like I'm a big uh, division fan. Uh, the division two is in China. The, the, they, it's, it's a game you can buy and play there, but it's a free to play game that resembles the game that we have everywhere else. Uh, but it has a bunch of stuff taken out that doesn't comply with their rules and regulations there. Um, and it's literally developed by a different team than the game that is played everywhere else um, for various reasons. But I assume mostly for uh, so that they can localize it uh, simply. Um, and it's 
Uh, so it's free to play. It's hyper monetized. Like if you think the division is monetized on its own, if you, you know, I would suggest looking up the, the way they have it monetized where basically everything has a value that you have to pay for. And it has like completely different skins and gear. And it's, it's, it's almost a different game, uh, but they definitely share a lot of their base stuff. Um, that is part of this. They, they, they're, they're just, it's kind of how things work uh, with that market. Um, there, there was, you know, some pretty big stories about how they, uh, broke steam concurrent, uh, player records. I had seen that they had broken 2 million concurrent players. I guess somewhere I saw that they had broken 3 million. I don't know if that was steam or everywhere. Um, but it, uh, it reportedly has sold, uh, 10 million copies in the first three days it's been out. So a uh, really big hit. Um, there was some kind of, I, I want to call it interesting conversation, um, uh, because it, it, it could be taken the wrong way. I think of how, you know, there were some early kind of conspiracy theories and thoughts that, man, it sure is weird that, that this game that, you know, had some hype, but definitely wasn't that hyped. And, you know, it seems like it's good, but it's not like a game of the year game. Like, how is it getting this kind of attention? And um, the initial thought was like, well, it, you know, some people were seeing some demographic uh, stats and things like that. That was something like 95% of the concurrent players uh, were all in China. And then there were, of course, accusations there of like, you know, that they were botting numbers or giving out free accounts or whatever. But selling those 10 million copies in three days, I mean, it's, you know, even if, you know, 8 million of those were in China, like that's a giant market. And this is a game that was, it's literally based on, you know, some mythology from there. Um, and that, that's a, uh, that, that's a market that's hungry for games. And so, um, I think it's right. I think you should probably dismiss, um, any of the, uh, kind of, you know, kind of problematic, uh, takes on why this is happening. Um, but you know, it worked. And the fact that this game isn't on Xbox and won't be for a while uh, isn't a great look with all the other stuff going on, um, though it, I think it is important uh, for my fanboy self to remind that um, the most recent commentary on why it's not on Xbox, they initially kind of like vaguely said it was due to development issues, which everyone immediately went to Series S was causing issues. Um, and then later on, Microsoft replied by saying, kind of not that vaguely that they can't control the deals that uh, third-party publishers make with other platforms, which at least to me really heavily insinuated that uh, there, there was some kind of last minute deal made with PlayStation where uh, it's going to be exclusive there for, you know, some time, probably six months. Uh, so don't be surprised if we see the Xbox version come out uh, in, in about five and a half months. Um, and those deals are fine, but it, it, it sucks with the current climate that especially when they are like unannounced deals and they aren't like publicly disclosed, which they don't have to be, um, that it just kind of adds to a not great conversation. But, you know, the, the other answer to that is that if Xbox didn't want this to happen, they should have paid up and, you know, made it exclusive on theirs and they'd be reaping all the benefits here. So it is what it is. Uh, then the last thing during Gamescom, we did get confirmation that Borderlands 4 is in development. And I think it's due out in next year, in 2025. Uh, this was interesting timing uh, because the Borderlands movie finally released uh, has done unbelievably bad, uh, both review-wise and financially, uh, and is already going to be hitting uh, digital platforms at the end of this month in August, on August 30th. So, Yeah. You know, we definitely have The Last of Us and Fallout on one end of the spectrum. And then I guess we have uh, Borderlands and uh, was it Tim Sweeney, uh, his his ego on the other end. Uh, some final kind of updates and stuff. Um, as you can see, uh, you might be able to see the if you're watching the video version of the podcast, the painter's tape that's along the trim down there. I will be painting this weekend and getting this office moving. Um, I do also plan on just, I'm just gonna start releasing this podcast as soon as it's available. I, I've been trying to do the, uh, exclusive to YouTube members for a while and, um, multiple people who are members. And I suspect they you know, probably represent the opinion of everyone. No one's, you know, subscribing or, or paying or supporting me, uh, because of the exclusive things. It's just to support and, and, you know, try to help kind of 
give uh, funding and uh, to, to make the time worth it for all these things I do. Uh, so that will be changing. Um, I did get a Star Wars Outlaws uh, early review code, which I am currently cracking on. Uh, that is uh, able to be, re- you know, we can talk about that. The embargo is on uh, this coming Monday, uh, which is the 26th and uh, that, that morning. So I'm not going to finish the game. There's no way I, I can tell. I'm like probably barely in the first quarter of the game uh, without revealing too much. Um but I'll try to do a like first impressions kind of in progress review uh, that can come out on the embargo. And then hopefully later on when I finally finish the game, I'll try to do something a little more comprehensive. And uh, I'm especially interested in how the game ends. If there is an, uh, like an on, like an after end game, uh, you know, thing or not. Um, but that's coming. And then the final thing is if you catch this early enough on this coming Saturday and Sunday, which is the 24th and 25th uh, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, I have the ability to get Twitch drops for uh, Escape from Tarkov right after they've uh, done a new wipe for their game and a new big update. Um, this can be a pretty big deal for people who get this opportunity. I will not be streaming for 12 hours uh, for two days. Not going to happen. Uh, but I do plan on jumping on for a few hours each day uh, to check out the new patch. I haven't really got to play it much yet. And uh, I'll be trying to mix that in with you know painting the office and, and doing everything else I have to do in the day. And that is where I'm going to wrap this episode up. Next episode is episode 300. Uh, If I have to be straight up, I don't have anything special planned. Um, I I will maybe try to get a guest or get like an interview or something set up in this next week uh, that maybe I can release. I think uh, actually I have a couple ideas that maybe I could do something cool with that, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, But, you know, I'll at least maybe try to do a giveaway or something or Uh, Or we'll try to do something fun for that 300th episode, which I'm really excited to record. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And please consider supporting all of my content by watching, listening, sharing, and following all of my socials or throwing a few bucks my way via the link in the show description. If you have your own topics, questions, or feedback, please let me know in my Discord and the YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at Bondiesel or at The Bonfire. That is all I have for this episode of the Bonfire Gaming Podcast. So, until next time.